an idea born in unsettled times. We are going forward. America, the United States, is first in space. Becomes a feat of engineering excellence. The most complex machine ever built to bring humans to and from space to roll discovery. and eventually construct the next stop on the road to space exploration. We are on a true spaceship now. As 30 years of flight draw to a close, its legacy is one of unsurpassed achievement, tragedy overcome, and opportunity met. NASA Space Shuttle. Space Shuttle Endeavour is rolling out to launch pad 39A at NASA's Kennedy Space Center in Florida. In 24 missions, flown over 20 years, Endeavour has logged more than 103 million miles in space. The last of NASA shuttles to be built, Endeavour prepares for her final flight, STS. 134. I marvel at when I when I see the space shuttle up close and personal, behind the panels where we have hardware, plumbing, black boxes, electronic devices, and that sort of thing. The workmanship that I see in this is astounding. And that points right at the people that do this. When you integrate all that together, it results in, in what I think has been a marvelous program with the space shuttle. Well before any shuttle reaches the launch pad, however, a staggering amount of work is required. The parts, plans, and people necessary to make each launch span the entire nation. One single goal is the focus, the safety of the orbiter and her crew. You've got all these people, all these folks that are in their 20s, some of them in their 30s, and they are no kidding in charge of some part of the space shuttle, some part of the space station, or some part of the plan and every one of those people absolutely believes that they are the one that makes the difference on getting those astronauts back down to the ground alive. At NASA's Mission Assembly Facility in New Orleans, production begins on the shuttle's external fuel tank. The last of 136 produced here since 1973. Each one, 154 feet tall and 27.6 feet around, is capable of handling 535,000 gallons of liquid hydrogen and oxygen, enough to fill 13,375 average household bathtubs. Three versions of the external tank were created during the program in an effort to reduce the tank's overall weight and allow for heavier shuttle payloads. Around the same time, in Clearfield, Utah, technicians at ATK Launch Systems start work on the shuttle system's solid rocket motors One, or boosters. Fire. Together, these SRBs produce nearly six million pounds of thrust, about 83% of the thrust needed to push the orbiter into space. The remaining 17% is furnished by the shuttle's three main engines fueled by the external tank. Unlike the orange external tank that is used only once, the boosters detach themselves and parachute into the Atlantic Ocean. They are then retrieved, refurbished, and reused on later missions. The shuttle mission's crew is assigned. Folks on there that are like my brothers and sisters. I mean, it, we really do get close after a year of training for a flight and having flown in space together. And there's a special bond that comes with that. Right up until launch, a shuttle crew will train in a variety of critical regimens, some basic, others specific to their mission. Simulators, safety and contingency, science experiments, and underwater in the world's largest indoor pool. STS-134 astronauts floating in actual spacesuits trained to work during extravehicular activities, or EVAs. The Neutral Buoyancy Lab, or NBL, at NASA's Johnson Space Center in Houston, 
is the best simulation of microgravity on Earth, an ideal for practicing spacewalks. One of the most uh, amazing facilities that we work in is the NBL, the Neutral Buoyancy Lab. And the divers and the guys who run, help us run the robotic arm are all there to ensure that our spacewalks are flawless. Their efforts in that pool have helped us and made us able to have this program. Every step of a spacewalk, every step of EVA is so critical. And even though we see it every day, that's what that one little safety tether could be life or death. For every hour that they spend in orbit, they'll spend five to six hours training for that same task. So we've built up from the suit engineers and suit technicians who help them get into the suit. Now we've got trainers who help them learn how to use the suit and learn how to understand the suit. And then we've got divers who support them while they're in the pool. The closer they get to actually flying in the suit, the team of people who help them tends to grow. Maybe not exponentially, but it's certainly getting bigger. The 12-person crew has kept a week-long vigil, while the barge, carrying with E.T., made the 900-mile trek from Louisiana to Florida's central east coast. The iconic orange external tank finally arrives at the Kennedy Space Center. One month later, the E.T. is mated to the solid rocket boosters to form the backbone of the stack. Now, all that's missing is the spacecraft itself. When an orbiter returns from a mission, processing for the next flight begins almost immediately. It's a task requiring no less than 650,000 hours of labor. This includes the removal of its three liquid fuel engines and their replacement by three from a previous mission. They've been refurbished, inspected, and tested at the Stennis Space Center. With most of its flight preparations complete, Endeavour is towed in what is called the rollover, a short roll over a quarter mile distance on a 36-wheeled vehicle from the Orbiter Processing Facility, the OPF, to the VAB. Here it undergoes its flight configuration. The rollout. Looking now much like it will at liftoff, the space shuttle is carried to the launch pad atop the six million pound crawler transporter at a blazing pace of less than a mile an hour. Not exactly warp speed. At our peak carrying full load, we get uh, right around 38 feet per gallon. Not too bad for an original 1965 hybrid vehicle with low miles. The 3.4 mile journey takes up to six hours just enough time to appreciate the route's picturesque surroundings. Kennedy Space Center is situated on a National Wildlife Refuge. Bald eagles, osprey, and vultures are just a few of the scores of bird species regularly spotted in local skies. Both land and sea are home to a wide variety of creatures, including manatees, dolphins, and of course, the ever-present alligator. Visitors are always urged to watch their step. Now on the launch pad, the orbiter is ready to take on its main payload. Testing assures that the multi-ton cargo is secured and safely stowed in the payload bay before the technicians certify the orbiter is ready for launch. Flying T-38 aircraft from Ellington Field in Houston, the crew members arrive at Kennedy's shuttle landing facility. But finally the day comes when you're there and you're getting ready to launch. And you go into launch countdown and it's like going up the hill on that roller coaster. They're just full of expectation and you're both thrilled and terrified at the same time because anything could go wrong, but when it goes right, it's a thing of beauty. If there are no issues or concerns, technicians begin fueling the external tank 
with volatile liquid hydrogen and oxygen. The predominant emotion is pride. There's a tremendous sense of pride in all that, that not only that you do, but that your teammates do, that people in this, this very firing room do, and folks all across the country. This is shuttle launch control, T minus nine minutes. At the T minus nine minute hold, the launch director leads one final pull. We finally come out of the hold at T minus nine minutes. I sit back and I watch my data, but I know that there are souls on board that ship that, uh, whose lives are depending on, on uh, the launch team to make the right decisions. It's, uh, I don't think about that consciously, the, 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 the decision making, authority and responsibility, I know it's there, um, but I do think consciously about the crew as a, and, and the people we're about to, about to put on top of a controlled explosion and get to orbit. This is the NTD conducting the launch status check. All stations verify are ready to resume count and go for launch. OTC, OTC go. TVC, TVC go. ETC, ETCs go. LPS, LPS is go. Houston flight. Houston flight is go. After nearly three years, hundreds of thousands of hours logged by engineers, technicians, scientists, seamstresses, electricians, and other program workers across the globe. We have main engine start. Two, one, booster ignition. The shuttle makes its way skyward. At liftoff, 6.6 .6 million pounds of thrust begin hurtling the vehicle and crew at speeds that'll reach 17,500 miles per hour. The shuttle is like no other machine ever built. For its launch to succeed, more than a million parts must move together perfectly. How this engineering marvel came to be is an amazing story that begins in the early 1970s. The Vietnam War is divisive and costly. The economy is sliding into recession. And with the race to the moon already won, the Apollo program is canceled. A new mission is sought for NASA to send humans into space. But Mars, for many the next logical step on the path of exploration, is dismissed as too costly, a destination for a country preoccupied with events back on Earth. Instead, on January 5, 1972, another destination is selected, low Earth orbit. As early as the mid-1960s, NASA had concluded that the technology was available to build and fly a reusable spacecraft. President Nixon really liked the idea and, uh, and, and told the NASA administrator, go do it. And the NASA administrator got a call from OMB the next morning, someone there, and said, hey, what the president really meant to say was, you're going to get this much money, and so do as best you can with the space transportation system. And our choice, uh, logically, was well, you have to have a vehicle first, and so that, that was the birth of the space shuttle as the first in the three-part space transportation system. Many designs were considered. Often, they combined the best features of different concepts. At that time, they were looking at having jet engines on the shuttle for landing and for transporting it across the country. The idea of the lifting bodies was to bring astronauts home to a conventional runway landing. Previously, all of our spacecraft, which were capsules, came down in the ocean. Someone came up with the idea of a vehicle that could land like an airplane. The key thing was to understand aerodynamic stability across the hypersonic, supersonic, subsonic, and landing speed type of environments that a single vehicle has to fly safely. That was the key thing that was learned from those, and you'll see it reflected in the shape of the space shuttle. One was the use of a lifting body, an aircraft with no conventional wings. Only its fuselage would keep the aircraft airborne and guide it safely back to Earth. They were known as the flying bathtubs. For the first test, the M2F1 was towed behind a car, souped up Pontiac. Whitey Whitesides drove that Pontiac across the lake bed at about 120 miles per hour, dragging this flying bathtub behind it. As well as groundbreaking, 
their tests could also prove ground shaking. The X-24B, a lifting body with wings, was the first such craft to land on an actual runway, as all shuttles would eventually do. Early on, the space shuttle was going to have jet engines to return for a horizontal landing, much like an airliner. The X-15 had proven fairly specifically that they can make horizontal landings very accurately, unpowered, flying a steep glide slope, that they could do a horizontal, uh, unpowered landing with the shuttle. As they tried to narrow its size, shape, and weight, engineers also considered how this new orbiter would be propelled safely out of the reach of Earth's gravity. At the Marshall Space Flight Center in Huntsville, home of the rockets that had sent every Mercury, Gemini, and Apollo astronaut into space. All engine running. Liftoff. We have a liftoff. Design teams would devise the partially reusable propulsion system that would finally be adopted. The main engines were always something we paid very close attention to. Lots of moving parts, lots of, lots of uh, high energy in very tight places and very cold liquid on one side of a very small wall and very hot on the other side. When that thing finally lit off, for me, it just showed the power of a space shuttle main engine and then there's three on the back of an orbiter and then there's the two solid rocket motors. Um, that was probably the, the spark that, that got me so interested in the space shuttle program in general and, and what it took to actually get one engine to light, much less three and two boosters uh, to take the shuttle to orbit. As for the orbiter, spiraling costs forced NASA to abandon equipping it with its own jet engines and escape pod. Originally it was going to be an air-breathing uh, airplane that would fly to space as a rocket and then come back to Earth. The orbital maneuvering system pods that sit on the back now were to be where deployable air breathing engines would come out and it would be able to fly from uh, its intended point of landing to another place if the weather were bad or something like that. NASA's new shuttle would essentially glide its way back to Earth. Producing the components of this new space transportation system fell to familiar names in the space industry. Prime contractor Rockwell North American, now Boeing, had built the Apollo Command Service Module. Morton Thiokol, now ATK, would build the solid rocket boosters. And Martin Marietta, now Lockheed Martin, would construct the ET. Responsibility for producing the space shuttle's main engines went to Rocketdyne, now Pratt Whitney. There was a lot of teamwork that was going on. It was bringing people from all across the country, from Kennedy, from Johnson, from Marshall. So many people involved that had to have worked together. Now, at the beginning, there was a lot of anxiety that we weren't going to work together. But when people got to know each other and could trust each other, that's when the work began. It was uh, an amazing vehicle, and in a lot of ways, way ahead of its time, to have a reusable spacecraft that could carry such tremendous amounts of, of uh, cargo to, uh, to space uh, was unprecedented. September 1976, more than four and a half years after President Nixon signed off on its development, America's new spacecraft, Constitution, gets its first close-up before the cameras. The orbiter itself was well received by the public, but impassioned fans of a particular long-canceled television series called Star Trek wanted it called something else. They staged a successful write-in campaign and the orbiter was renamed for the Starship featured on the show. Thus, NASA's new shuttle would be the Enterprise, boldly going as no spacecraft had ever gone before. Whatever its name, this bird still needed to prove it could fly. In an age before computer simulations, balsa wood models and wind tunnel testing was the only means to test the airliner-sized glider. We put together a very aggressive uh, flight test profile that consisted of data points continuously all the way down. There, were just not, there was not a, a matter of 10 seconds went by without 
another either pitch doublet or a rudder kick or an angle of attack sweep. Uh, the things that really turn on a test pilot to fly them as accurately as possible. August 12, 1977. On a crystal clear California morning, high above the Mojave Desert, two NASA test pilots ready for Enterprise's first flight. The plan was for Fred Hayes, Jr. and Gordon Fullerton to lift the orbiter off a modified 747, then land on a dry lake bed 15,000 feet below. The thing that uh, we were most concerned about was if we were going to be able to get to a launch speed, if uh, Fitz Fulton was going to be able to put the 747 into a slight dive so that we would have enough lift on the uh, Enterprise to, when we did push the separation button, blow the bolts to lift away from the airplane without hitting Fitz's tail. And of course, both of us were interested in, 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 uh, in that happening. The pilots on the 747, Fitz Fulton and Tom McMurtry, sit and wait for the command to release and steer their massive aircraft out from under Enterprise. There were still questions about was it going to actually uh, happen uh, as we expected from those simulations and the analysis and everything. Uh, there's a very loud thump when the shuttle separates. There was always a question was the shuttle going to slide back and hit the tail of the 747. But uh, we couldn't see that, but uh, it, we could, after a few seconds, we could tell it didn't hit us. And so the chase called clear. Once we reached the 240 knots and Fitz called on speed, I think he really pushed some of the sensors he was looking at in order to let us get to there, but, and we appreciated that. But once, once we heard Fitz say on speed, um, I pushed the separation button and we, we just broke free. We had about one and a half Gs of lift. Honestly, that was probably the most exciting moment in the approach and landing test, to feel and be there when the shuttle separated from the 747. By all accounts, this first freefall test is a success. Five weeks later, Enterprise is brought to 22,000 feet for her second freefall test. Pilots Joe Engel and Dick Truly have only two minutes to capture flight and maneuvering data before landing the aircraft again without any engines. It was a real team effort, and the challenge was for Dick Trulli and I to fly that profile and fly those data points, uh, those maneuvers, as precisely as possible to give them the best data possible. It was, it was a test pilot's dream. A total of 16 taxi, captive, and drop tests confirmed the soundness of the craft's design and green-lighted production of the first space-worthy orbit. NASA's first orbiter is fittingly named after the first American vessel to circumnavigate the globe. However, Columbia quickly becomes a daunting challenge for NASA. Its complex makeup had engineers struggling constantly to reduce Columbia's weight and simplify construction. Especially frustrating was keeping the orbiter's ceramic tiles attached to its fuselage more than 25,000 of them fit together to protect Columbia from the searing 3,000 degree heat of re-entry. We were having a lot of problems with the thermal protection system of the tiles. Uh, the way we were trying to glue them on, they wouldn't, wouldn't stay on. And we had to come up with a way of making sure that they'd stay on. And we had some really great people that worked that, and that's why it took such a long time. I had hoped it was not going to take that long since uh, John and I were named as a crew, so we had a lot more time to train than what I had, <laughs> we had both initially planned. The requirement was to be able to handle temperatures like 2,500 degrees F that occur on the surface of the, of the TPS, and that's five times what your oven is at, at home that you bake cookies under at max. The other problem is weight because after all, this is an airplane, so you can't have a metallic system on it that weighs tons. It has to be extremely lightweight. And in fact, the shuttle tiles are about 90% air, and th that gives the combination of being able to be temperature resistant and yet at the same time light. 
Each Orbiter has a unique number of protective tiles. Challenger was built with the most, 31,088, while Atlantis has the fewest, a mere 24,177. Over in Palmdale, they had put on their first effort of putting the, the tiles on to protect the aluminum from the heating they were going to get on re-entry. And some of those tiles, when they put them on in the daytime, next morning the tiles were on the hangar floor. And so that was real scary that they could lose some tiles while they were on orbit and really have a problem with the heat coming back on re-entry. Columbia had a lot of tiles missing yet, uh, needed quite a bit of work before we could deliver it to the Cape. And uh, we scrounged throughout the city of Lancaster for uh, RTV, which was the, the material we used to glue the tiles on with. More glue did keep the tiles in place. However, water was literally ripping them apart. It turns out in the instant we hit rain, the tiles almost exploded. The tiles fabrication process was modified and the problem overcome. Other shuttle design features proved less problematic and more groundbreaking. A computerized digital flight control system, now common in commercial and military aircraft, was developed for the orbiter. In flying the space shuttle, you were so aware that you weren't necessarily talking to the shuttle, you were talking to a computer who in turn was going to talk to the, to the shuttle. Barriers of race and gender were falling everywhere, and America's core of shuttle astronauts would become more reflective of the nation it served. There's been a lot that's, that the shuttle era has done to bring uh, spaceflight into, into the, the domain of, of the average person. We know it's not just crew cut white test pilots anymore. It's, it's the, essentially the United Nations that flies on the space shuttles. It's, it's people of every description that look very much like the rest of us. The astronaut selection process reflected a changing nation and a changing NASA. At the time, all the astronauts were military test pilots and there were no females, so it was kind of like one of those dreams that you hope will happen someday, but you didn't really think would. The NASA astronaut class of 1978, the largest in the agency's history, came from all walks of American life. Physicists, meteorologists, fighter pilots, scientists, and for the first time, women and African Americans. When I came into the astronaut program in 78, uh, there were three African Americans that came in at the same time. And it was the first time that NASA had hired African Americans. We had Fred Gregory, who was a test pilot, and then two, Ron McNair, who was a mission specialist, and I came in as a mission specialist. So all three of us were excited about uh, flying in space, and we all, all three of us recognized that we were really gonna open up the envelope for other African Americans to fly in space. While the new class of NASA astronauts trained for subsequent shuttle flights, Columbia was undergoing preparations for the program's maiden voyage, STS-1. <music> Veteran astronaut John Young, one of the 12 men to set foot on the moon, is in command. His pilot is first-time flyer Bob Crippen. To be sitting on board up there with my buddy John Young, uh, and get to experience the whole thing from ascent to being on orbit to flying re-entry. Uh, it uh, was one of the high points of my career. Together they would travel over a million miles and circle the Earth 36 times. The launch finally occurred. We'd been waiting and postponing and postponing and, and uh, when it finally lifted off and we knew it was going and, and achieved orbit, uh, we were all in anxious anticipation for what was going to happen next. Launched like a rocket two days earlier, Columbia lands as a glider on the dry lake bed of Edwards Air Force Base in California. I'm watching uh, out the window. Uh, watching the sea and the clouds rush by, it actually gave a, a sense of speed, more so than, um, uh, than when we were up in orbit, uh, being much higher. Uh, I think they were all very relieved because there had been some concern because we had lost some tiles initially on, on the orbit and they didn't know whether we'd lost any on the bottom or not. 
flew down over the San Joaquin Valley. We do a big turnaround to land on the, on the lake bed for that first flight. And I remember when John went into a bank, a big left bank, I looked down at the lake bed, and there's thousands of people out there on the lake bed. John, look at all those folks. Uh, would Ted come out to see us land? Joe Engel was chased, hear his voice coming in on final. Uh, talking to John Young and, and Crip in, in the airplane that they were right on glide slope coming in for a landing and then have that landing and then have John Young do his Young dance. He, he was just so elated. Uh, it was such a magnificent flying machine uh, to him at that time. The first time I really saw a real shuttle was uh, Columbia when it was out on a lake bed after the landing and I'm walking around it. I couldn't believe they sent that big a mass up in the air. People really thought this was all impossible. So what we do, what we have done and shown and demonstrated through the shuttle program is we've shown that we can take the impossible and make it possible. Thousands of spectators line up along the landing strip to greet the shuttle and its two-man crew. Anyone who was associated with the program or there just to see the shuttle return, I think felt a lot of pride in our country and our space program. And so uh, that, those emotions were, you know, finally released and you said, wow, you know, the flight was uh, done safely, they're back home, uh, the, the shuttle really does work. It's a great program, it's got a great future ahead of it. Hey, this thing works <laughs> and, uh, and we got it back all in one piece, which is what we wanted to do. While Columbia's return was spectacular, it would renew NASA engineers' worries about the shuttle's thermal protection system. During the post-landing inspection, 148 of the orbiter's tiles were found shattered, and 16 more were missing due to the effects of an overpressure wave. While that and other issues were addressed, the 50-ton Columbia would be placed atop the specially configured 747 and ferried back to Florida and processing for its next mission. It's a massive enterprise. It's over eight stories tall uh, sitting on the ground and uh, it's, you never get over that site. It's really awesome. After the shuttle lands, there's a processing procedure for the shuttle. Post-flighting it, uh, checking the tires, checking the struts, uh, measure, get the right, correct measurements. And then uh, when the shuttle is ready to uh, uh, mate with, with the 747, we would tow underneath and then they would lower the, the space shuttle down on the supports on top of the aircraft. We would take off. <laughs> on takeoffs from the extra long runways of Edwards Air Force Base, the shuttle carrier aircraft's crew of four would soon grow accustomed to the smell of burning rubber. That's the intense heat generated by their plane spinning tires as they carry two massive aircraft at more than 100 miles an hour. The average range of a 747 is about 5,000 miles, but due to its weight, configuration, and special flight requirements, the SCA can travel only 1,000 miles at a time. A full turn in the jet can take several zip codes. Cruising at more than 250 miles per hour, the jumbo jet burns 40,000 pounds of fuel per hour. That's 130 pounds per mile, or the length of a football field per gallon. No wonder it has to make several stops before reaching Florida's east coast. We would get a spacecraft back, go over it again, be sure that we could reuse it, repair it where we had to do it. had never been, never been done before. And so I think that's one of the marvelous things about the space shuttle was we found a way to, to turn this spacecraft around and use it again. Before the end of 1982, Columbia would fly four more missions. Lift off of America's space shuttle. Including STS-5, the first with a crew of more than two astronauts. Challenger, the second orbit in the shuttle fleet, made her maiden flight on April 4th, 1983. And liftoff, liftoff of the Orbiter Challenger and the sixth flight of the space shuttle. STS-6 deployed a communications satellite and featured the first spacewalk of the shuttle era. Just two months later, shuttle Challenger was back in orbit, 
this time with the first American woman in space. Physicist Dr. Sally Ride was a member of Commander Bob Crippen's STS-7 crew that deployed Canadian and Indonesian satellites during the six-day mission. Challenger was ready for flight in less than two months, another NASA first. Shuttling the first African-American to space, an Air Force combat pilot, Guy Bluford. For me, it was an exciting moment because it was something that I had been training for for 15 to 16 months, and so I was looking forward to the experience of flying in space. We are in an era of brotherhood. Yeah, lift off, lift off of Mission 41D, the first flight of the Orbiter Discovery. In 1984 to 86, the newest orbiter, Discovery, would fly a record six missions. And liftoff, liftoff of mission 51D and the seven-member crew of Discovery. Carrying into space satellites, international astronauts, even a U.S. senator and a congressman. One year after Discovery's debut, Atlantis flew her first mission. Liftoff, liftoff of Atlantis. A new orbiter joins the shuttle fleet and it has cleared the tower. STS-51J. It was also one of seven classified missions the space shuttle would fly for the Department of Defense. By the end of 1985, the space shuttle program had completed 23 missions, including nine that year alone. Each successful flight had the unintended consequence of convincing some that spaceflight, once considered among humankind's most inherently dangerous endeavors, had become routine. That notion would soon be tragically dispelled. Well, I am so excited to be here. Amid much fanfare, Krista McAuliffe, an elementary school instructor from Concord, New Hampshire, had been chosen from among 11,000 applicants to be NASA's first teacher in space. I would like to humanize the space age by giving a perspective from a non-astronaut because I think the students will look at that and say, this is an ordinary person. This ordinary person is contributing to history, and if they can make that connection, then they're going to get excited about history, they're going to get excited about the future, they're going to get excited about space. The American public's interest in its space program was renewed by her participation and was eager to see her off. Commanding the flight was Dick Scobie. His pilot was Michael Smith. Serving as Challenger's mission specialists are Judy Resnick, Ellison Onizuka, and Ron McNair, Joining McAuliffe as a payload specialist was Greg Jarvis. From the start, STS-51L was plagued by delays, mostly due to unseasonably cold temperatures in Florida. Rather than give pause for thought, the delays only tried the nation's patience. Everyone, it seemed, was itching to go. January 28th, the ground temperature at Launch Pad 39B was a frigid 36 degrees ice could be seen on the launch vehicle. Despite concerns voiced by some, shuttle managers reluctantly decided to press ahead for a late morning liftoff. Six, we have main engine start. Four, three, two, one, and liftoff. Liftoff of the 25th space shuttle mission, and it has cleared the tower. Challenger, go with throttle up. At 11.39 Eastern, twice the speed of sound, the Challenger's fuselage breaks apart from the inside out. America's space program suffers its first fatalities in flight. God, no! All seven Challenger crew members perish. Okay, everybody, stay off the telephones. Make sure you maintain all your data. Start pulling it together. We come together today to mourn the loss of seven brave Americans to share the grief that we all feel and perhaps in that sharing to find the strength to bear our sorrow and the courage to look for the seeds of hope. The investigation, headed by former Secretary of State William Rogers, would fault a solid rocket booster O-ring, rendered defective by the bitter cold. But the Commission's findings also address the human factor. The role played by shuttle program managers in sending Challenger aloft that day. The shuttle program came to a halt 
It took more than two and a half years of arduous engineering analysis and painful soul searching before a retooled and reborn shuttle would return to flight. Challenger was tough because it not only represented a breakdown in communications, but it just, it represented everything that's wrong or, or you know, wrong about an agency like, like we are, where segments of the agency weren't talking to each other and didn't know everything that we should know. We thought we knew where all the risks were and, and had them pretty well contained. Uh, the, uh, the solid rocket boosters that caused the accident, obviously there was something that had slipped through. Uh, so uh, we went back uh, throughout you know, the complete vehicle, all the systems, and uh, did a complete uh, uh, review and, and trying to uh, find any other things that we may have missed that may be lurking there. When things are really starting to look smooth and you're starting to get maybe overconfident in a way, then it's time for you to step back Think about what you're doing, go back and look, do some additional testing, and see if there's something that, that you really hadn't anticipated that is going on with your system. During a lot of that time, uh, we got a lot of criticism that maybe the agency had lost its edge. There were folks inside the agency that started, started losing their confidence, thinking maybe we can't do this anymore. Two and a half years later when we flew and then landed that flight, it showed that no, we really can't overcome really, really large problems, really tough technical problems today just like we could 10 years ago, 20 years ago, or 50 years ago. That was, a, that was an important milestone. And liftoff, liftoff, Americans return to space as Discovery clears the tower. On September 29, 1988, 975 days after the loss of Challenger and her crew, the orbiter Discovery returned six veteran astronauts to space to deploy a tracking and data relay satellite important to a number of NASA missions. STS-26 proved a comeback milestone for the space shuttle and initiated a tradition that survives with the program today. During the flight, we had roses show up in the mission control center. Six roses, five red, one white. And there was a card attached to it, and it simply said, congratulations, return to flight, we wish you well. And it was signed Mark, Terry, and Mackenzie Shelton. Didn't know who they were, but after the flight, we uh, through the, the floral company, we, we tracked them down so we could send them some pictures and, and something to thank them for sending the roses to Mission Control. So the next flight, roses show up again. And again, it's five roses for the members of the crew and one rose for those who have lost their lives in this endeavor. And so this family, they have become part of our family. And they haven't missed a flight since. Every flight since that time, and, and to date, and I suspect they're going to go right with us to the end of the shuttle program. STS-26 ended on October 3, 1988, at Edwards Air Force Base, California, with Discovery's safe landing on runway 17. The triumphant crew was greeted warmly by Vice President George Bush on behalf of a proud and grateful nation. There's something special about a return to flight that, that makes you, you have some trepidation because you're, it's still fresh in your mind that you're, you're frail and, and you can make mistakes and you're human. In the spring of 1990, the $1.5 billion Hubble Space Telescope was loaded into Space Shuttle Discovery's payload bay and on April 24th was sent aloft to be deployed to Earth orbit on STS-31. Capcom, we have a go for release. Discovery, go for Hubble release. Okay, we have a go for release. As envisioned, Hubble would return never before seen images detailing our universe as it was millions upon millions of years before. Soon it would become clear that Hubble pictures were not. Several days later, if not a couple of weeks, we found out after we were back on Earth that it had a problem with its vision. And most of us were just devastated, you know, that here we had this marvelous instrument that we had put on orbit and it was going to be useless. It turned out that it wasn't useless at all because even as with its flaw, it was still a much better telescope than anything that we had, you know, on Earth. A shuttle mission dedicated to the telescope's repair was planned. In essence, Hubble's nearsightedness would be corrected with a new pair of glasses. Lift off of the Space Shuttle Endeavour on an ambitious mission to service the Hubble Space Telescope. We finally flew uh, STS-61, which was the first Hubble servicing mission. Absolutely incredible mission. But clearly we have a dynamic situation. You cannot take the 84-inch mirror out of the telescope. It's part of structure, too big, it's there. 
So by putting in one box called CoStar, and we're able to correct air brain light for five other instruments. Of all the space shuttle missions we've flown, it was without a doubt the most ambitious flight, but the one that I think demonstrated NASA's uh, can-do attitude, its technological skill, its technical capability, and the spirit of its people. Two teams of astronauts made a record five back-to-back -back spacewalks to refurbish Hubble and realize her potential to awe and astound. While Hubble servicing missions were very important, the true gift of a maneuverable shuttle was soon realized in a very different rescue mission. Booster ignition and liftoff of the maiden voyage of Endeavour on a satellite rescue mission. Months earlier, in May of 1992, the seven astronauts of STS-49 overcame initial setbacks to pluck the $180 million Intel Sat-6 communication satellite from an unusable orbit. It was gonna be a very simple rendezvous, you know, get close, bring the satellite down close and grapple it with the remote manipulator system. Everything that could go wrong went wrong. We got up there to capture it, uh, the, uh, the bar, we tapped the satellite and, the, and the, with the bar and the satellite started uh, moving out of control. Get me in, pitch me over. Into the arm, watch the end of the arm. It can be very difficult catching something like a tumbling satellite in space. The slightest touch or mistouch by the astronaut with the equipment, and you can send that satellite tumbling. Yeah, make sure that when you want me to yaw right, you say yaw right. Okay. Any other time right, it's just right. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Okay. Move. We're moving. And so it was very touch and go on that mission, actually. Commander Dan Branistein and pilot. Kevin Chilton are preparing for the upcoming terminal initiate burn. After several days of failed attempts with Endeavour's remote arm, Commander Dan Brandenstein literally tries a new approach. Yeah, real easy, guys, real easy. Don't bring us any closer, Dan. Okay, I'm stopping it. At Endeavour's helm, Brandenstein delicately maneuvers the orbiter up to the four and a half ton Intel Sat 6. The satellite is, is rolling out of control in three different axes at once, and you could actually fly the shuttle and, and fly this maneuver around and keep it aligned with it. Three people grabbed 18,000 pounds. Aware that any miscue could endanger not only the satellite, but also the ride home, spacewalkers Pierre Thuit, Tom Akers, and Rick Heap reach out and secure the satellite by hand. Okay, wait, wait. Let's do it. Got it. Easy, easy, easy. Get it sometimes. Get it time. Get it time. Oh, guys, a grip. Okay. Yeah, nice job, guys. Intel Sat-6 is released from the cargo bay with a new mini rocket motor for a gentle push to its proper orbit, where it remains today, fully functional. And as the shuttle program matured, so it seemed did relationships between the world's spacefaring nations. <laughs> On STS-47, the 50th space shuttle mission saw the orbiter Endeavour back in space on September 12, 1992. Yeah, yeah, the mission was a cooperative space lab venture between Japan and the United States that brought the first Japanese astronaut into orbit as a member of the seven-person shuttle crew. The Space Shuttle has launched people from different nations around this world that used to feel they could never ever work together. And it has ushered us from the Cold War to this really cooperative space program that we have with our international partners, including the former Soviet Union. Regardless of what language you speak, you speak and love space, and that's pretty cool. Uh, people, we have a lot in common with uh, engineers and scientists around the world, and that's kind of fun to work in a program like this. On February 3rd, 1995, Eileen Collins, the first woman to pilot a shuttle, 
was at the helm as Discovery gave the U.S. its first up-close look at the Mir space station. Collins flew the shuttle through a series of intricate maneuvers, approaching within 37 feet of the Russian spacecraft and later performing a fly-around by hand. And liftoff of the Space Shuttle Atlantis on a mission that will herald a new day of international cooperation in space. Four months later, on June 27, 1995, Shuttle Atlantis would lift off from the Kennedy Space Center to begin STS-71, the U.S. space program's 100th human space mission. It would take two more days before Atlantis caught up with and performed the first shuttle docking with the Mir space station. Yes, Houston, Atlantis, we have captured. Orbiting 220 miles above the Earth, a most unique and historic celebration took place. as the Mir space station welcomed its first American guests. Cosmonauts and astronauts together broke figurative bread, tortillas and fruit to be exact, in a renewed spirit of cooperation. Together, Shuttle and Mir formed the largest flying spacecraft the world had yet to see. It tipped the scales at 250 metric tons, more than a half a million pounds. Between 1994 and 98, the Shuttle Mir program would involve 11 shuttle missions, including in 1996, STS-76, which began a continuous U.S. presence aboard the Russian space station with a visit by Atlantis. Barely fluent in Russian, astronaut Shannon Lucid, a biochemist, embarked upon a mission that would dramatically enhance our understanding of life in space. When she finally landed at Edwards Air Force Base on Shuttle Atlantis, she held the female space endurance record for spending 188 days in orbit. A hero's welcome was in store. I'm here to say welcome home to Shannon Lucid. By the time Shuttle Mir ended with SDS-91, seven American astronauts had completed extended stays aboard the Russian space station. Tatiana Mativa, who I became very good friends with. And I remember us sitting in Red Square having dinner together with a full moon and remembering when I was a child all those, um, those parades, those May Day parades with the tanks going by. And here we were sitting there having a nice dinner under the full moon and with a lot of friendship. So it just goes to show how space can un unite people. And uh, that's one of, I think, one of the biggest benefits. Eight cosmonauts had flown to Mir on the U.S. shuttle, and NASA astronaut Norm Thager had become the first American to fly there or anywhere aboard a Soyuz spacecraft. In 2001, 15 years after its commissioning, Mir would be abandoned to break up and burn in Earth's atmosphere. By then, the process of building upon Mir's legacy of international cooperation in space had already begun. Whereas STS-61 had helped establish the Hubble Space Telescope as an icon of American ingenuity, STS-95 would update the hero's credentials of one John Glenn. On October 29, 1998, almost 37 years after becoming the first American to orbit the Earth as an original Mercury 7 astronaut, Glenn, now a 77-year-old former U.S. Senator, made his return to space. In contrast to his first flight, a three-orbit, four-and-a-half-hour foray inside the snug Friendship 7 capsule. The liftoff of Discovery with a crew of six astronaut heroes and one American legend. STS-95 would take eight days and circle the Earth 134 times. My main reason for being on that shuttle flight was to do research on aging. I was 77, we went up and, you know, NASA has charted some 52 different th uh, changes that occur in the human body when you go into space for a period of time. And the, several of those are very similar to what happens to the natural process of aging right here on Earth. Uh, body's immune system changes, you get less resistant to disease and infection. Uh, body's ability to absorb protein back into the muscles changes for the young people up there and for elderly here on Earth. 
uh, the objective was to take those things that are the same and see if we couldn't find any differences between my experience up there and their younger and the younger people I would fly with with the idea of finding in the human body what turns these different systems on and off. If we could do that, we might be able to make it possible for people to stay in space longer uh, without harmful effects and maybe cut out some of the frailties of old age right here on Earth. I really was happy to be, be assigned to that flight. In an interesting twist of fate, astronaut Glenn not only inspired both the young and old around the globe, but also a fresh political science and economics graduate, Lori Garver, the 18th Deputy Administrator of NASA. Having the ability at NASA to fly him again in space after his first flight was something we, I think, gave the nation, and it really helped explain what we were doing on the space shuttle. John Glenn was very, very focused on doing that exper those experiments for both, uh, I think, the older generation, but he was also an inspiration uh, to people growing up. Discovery carried a variety of payloads and research experiments. Arguably, the one most valuable was Glenn himself. Not only did he provide first-time data on what spaceflight might do to the body of a septuagenarian, Glenn also renewed the interest of the nation and the world in America's space shuttle program. While the program had and continued to successfully deploy and service science probes and satellites, as well as conduct on-orbit research, the space shuttle undertook a new, long-range task, perfectly suited to her specialized capabilities. You've got a spacecraft that can carry at least seven people into orbit, and with those seven people, you can do a huge amount of work. One mission, you can do multiple EVAs, you've got multiple crew members, you've got a huge payload, uh, just all kinds of capabilities to be able to construct and build bigger things in orbit. Less than two weeks after the Glenn's return to Earth, a Russian proton rocket departs the Baikonur Cosmodrome in Kazakhstan, carrying the Zarya module, the first component of the new International Space Station. Liftoff of the proton rocket and the Zarya control module. The International Space Station is underway. Two weeks after that, Space Shuttle Endeavour follows up with delivery of America's Unity module, the second piece of this largest space station puzzle ever to be constructed. Houston Endeavour, we have capture of Zarya. Not until July 2000 will the Russian Zvezda module be added, finally allowing for two Russian cosmonauts and their American Expedition One commander, Bill Shepard, to journey aboard a Soyuz spacecraft to the International Space Station and begin humankind's continuous extraterrestrial presence. Across the world, people are very, very interested in and delighted by the International Space Station and the science that has taken place there. Since only an orbiter's payload bay could hold the station's largest components, the multi-year, multi-mission building, outfitting, and servicing of the ISS with cargo and crew would become primarily a job for the shuttle. Amid these dynamic station building missions, one seemingly simple and relatively uncomplicated flight would prove problematic and threaten the very future of America's human spaceflight program. Since 1988, the Space Shuttle had completed 15 years of successful missions. Each was unique. Each had its own specific goals and tasks, and each had its own dedicated crew of astronauts who'd trained exhaustively to meet and carry them out. Yet each of those 87 flights did have two things in common. A safe launch. Liftoff of the Space Shuttle Discovery. And a safe landing. Nose gear touchdown. From the start, STS-107 seemed to be a mission out of sorts. By the time Columbia was finally ready to fly on January 16, 2003, its planned 16-day mission had been delayed no fewer than 18 times. All those delays had ultimately positioned the STS-107 as a sort of black sheep on the space shuttle program's launch schedule. Columbia's crew commander Rick Husband, pilot Willie McCool, and mission specialists Michael Anderson, Kalpna Chavla, Dave Brown, Laurel Clark, and Israeli astronaut 
Ilan Ramon would not go to the National Space Station. Their flight would require nothing more risky than orbiting the Earth. Booster ignition and liftoff of Space Shuttle Columbia with a multitude of national and international space research experiments. 82 seconds after launch, what was later described as a suitcase-sized chunk of frozen foam insulation breaks off Columbia's external tank and strikes the leading edge of the orbiter's left wing. Roger roll, Columbia. A routine same-day video review of the launch would reveal nothing unusual. However, higher resolution tracking camera film processed overnight and reviewed on flight day two by the mission's ascent team showed otherwise. You saw this little thing float toward the leading edge of the wing and, and like, uh, you know, it was like a snowball hitting something and then just being pulverized. But, but when you saw it hit, ooh, we just, we just winced because we knew, you know, the vehicle's going 500 miles an hour or better. It was inconceivable in hindsight that you could have that kind of impact um, at the speed that the vehicle was going and assume that there was no damage. And that's what we, we allowed ourselves to feel comfortable that we were right and we were dead wrong. Due to limitations in the visual clarity, the exact point of impact and extent of any damage could not be determined. If the foam strike had compromised Columbia's integrity, little, if anything, could be done to repair the orbiter in space. One week after launch, Mission Control emails the crew informing them of the debris strike. Save for a relatively minor problem with a leaky refrigeration unit, STS-107 had been without further incident. As scheduled, the order is given on the morning of February 1st for the Columbia crew to begin the landing procedure and come home to Florida. Traveling in excess of 12,000 miles per hour, the orbiter's belly begins to glow red as it descends into Earth's atmosphere. FYI, I've just lost four separate uh, temperature transducers on the left side of the vehicle, the hydraulic return temperatures. As reentry started and as the ground track went, went across the states, uh, there's a the ground track, of course, uh, changes color. You can tell where the shuttle is over what part of the country it is. No onboard. Well, that display stopped updating. In other words, that display froze in a certain position. Well, sometimes you have loss of data, you have some problem with the system on the ground where you'll have those kind of outages temporarily. Well, this lasted a bit longer. Then the uh, uh, call went up to the crew. You know, a call went up and no response. Well. I don't know, I just, I just begin to feel uneasy. Columbia, Houston, UHF, com check. At speeds above Mach 20, the stress becomes too much for the orbiter. We do not have any valid data at this time. The suitcase-sized chunk of foam had indeed punched a bowling ball-sized hole in the leading edge of Columbia's left wing. Within seconds, internal temperatures spike, signaling the cascade of structural disintegration. Only 16 minutes from home, Space Shuttle Columbia breaks apart in the skies over East Texas. All seven crew members are lost. GC flight. Fly GC. Lock the doors. Copy. And, and, and at that moment, I knew, I knew we lost them. The grief is heavy. Our nation shares in your sorrow and in your pride. And today we remember not only one moment of tragedy, but seven lives of great purpose and achievement. Within days, Hundreds of professionals from federal and state agencies across the country arrive in East Texas. They are joined by local volunteers to help NASA recover and catalog debris from Columbia in the hopes of, literally, piecing together an answer to the accident's cause. This is one of the many obstacles investigators are up against. It was um, uh, really heartwarming and very emotional for me to uh, to, to, uh, to see all of these people from around the country come in to the Piney Woods of East Texas 
and, and spend days and weeks there marching out through these through the woods looking for bits and pieces of the orbiter and so forth. If anybody ever wonders about the, uh, the strength of the backbone of this country, then they ought to have the privilege, like I do, to meet these people who have come here to do this. Uh, it, it just it, it shows you the fabric of what this country is made of. Determined to return to flight, stronger and safer, the grounded shuttle program had taken a fresh look at itself. During my watch, during my watch, um, uh, we lost the Columbia crew, and, and clearly as a flight director back in Challenger, we lost that crew. Um, I think about those every day, every day I come to work. I need to be very vigilant, I need to pay attention, and I need the people that work for us in this business to pay attention to what they're doing, because this is hard stuff that we do. It's very dangerous. We have not figured out a way to do a beam me up Scotty. Right now it takes a, a lot of hydrocarbons, uh, moving at very high speeds through fuel pumps at very high temperatures, high pressures to get into space and it takes a tremendous amount of effort to get out of space back in the atmosphere and get to get home. I was sent out to David Brown's parents home. I'll never forget this moment when Judge Brown looked at me and said, Leland, my son is gone. There is nothing you can do to bring him back. But the biggest tragedy would be if you don't continue to fly and carry on his legacy. Each of the remaining three orbiters was pulled apart and refurbished. New capabilities were devised for the crew and mission controllers to assess and repair damage while on orbit. Processes and procedures were also re-examined and reinvigorated. Crew safety would never again be taken for granted. Nearly two and a half years would pass before the nation would see another orbiter poised for launch from the Kennedy Space Center. By the time that we fly the flight, uh, it's something that it feels like we have flown many times. So if things don't go well, it becomes very, very natural for us to know at certain points during the mission, if this doesn't go well or if this significant system breaks or we have this type of emergency, what's the most important thing we, we need to do now because we've been rehearsing it and it makes it look really easy. You don't really get the full effect of how much real preparation, how much real studying went into making it look that easy. Of all the changes accompanying the shuttle's return to flight, none was more significant than the one announced in early 2004 at NASA headquarters by President Bush. Our first goal is to complete the International Space Station by 2010. We will finish what we have started we will meet our obligations to our 15 international partners on this project. The shuttle's chief purpose over the next several years will be to help finish assembly of the International Space Station. In 2010, the space shuttle, after nearly 30 years of duty, will be retired from service. Even though each shuttle was designed to fly 100 missions, the Columbia Accident it's Investigation it's Board called the shuttle an aging spacecraft with the odds of losing another orbiter and crew increasing with each subsequent flight. NASA's human spaceflight program was faced with several basic challenges, including coming up with a successor to the shuttle fleet. However, with an impending cancellation of the shuttle program looming, shuttle managers recommitted themselves to the paramount task of safely completing the International Space Station. It would become the program's mantra to be repeated over and over again, not only to the media, but also for every worker in the shuttle program. No launch schedule was too tight and no mission too important to be rushed. We ought to treat every flight, in a sense, as a return to flight. This is truly a test program. We go back, we make sure everything is right, we double check, and then we go commit in a flight readiness review that we're actually ready to go fly. On July 26, 2005, Discovery gets the shuttle program flying again. This is shuttle launch control at T minus three hours as our pilot. We're now into the suit up room.
LRD. LRD is go. SRO. SRO is go. Uh, so on behalf of the many millions of people who believe so deeply in what we do, good luck, Godspeed, and have a little fun up there. And thanks to you, to the launch team, and to everybody in the shuttle program, the crew is go for launch. T minus 10 seconds, go for main engine start. Seven, six, five, three engines up and burning. Three, two, one, and liftoff of Space Shuttle Discovery, beginning America's new journey, and the vehicle has cleared the tower. Among the many changes instituted, the new R-bar pitch maneuver or backflip. Station Discovery initiating RPM in three, two, one, mark. Will be used by each mission to the International Space Station. At arrival, the end over end flip allows the station crew to visually document the condition of the shuttle's belly and nose. Discovery and the STS-114 crew safely began the final phase of the shuttle program's historic journey with a smooth pre-dawn landing on August 9, 2005 at the Edwards Air Force Base, California. Stevie Ray, Suichi, Andy, Vegas, Charlie, Wendy, and Eileen, welcome home, friends. With this practically rebuilt space transportation system, each remaining shuttle mission would be safer than the one before, and its final flight, the safest. It's almost like we've had kind of three different uh, space shuttle programs. First 10 years, we're off learning how to fly the thing, deploying satellites and flying laboratories in the back. Next 10 years, we're doing more of that and we're going out on more and more spacewalks and we fly up to the Mir space station. And in the last 10 years, we use it to build about a million pound space station in orbit, which wouldn't have been possible without shuttle. It's a heck of a machine. When you look at the Hubble Space Telescope, uh, that would not have been possible without shuttle. And you look at the International Space Station, which certainly would not have been possible without shuttle. Uh, every launch is an emotional experience watching what this nation has done, what NASA has done with the, the NASA contractor team. It's awesome, it's wonderful. We didn't spend a dime in space. Not one single penny has been spent in space. Every single penny that went into the space shuttle program over its 30 plus years was spent right here on Earth. One, creating jobs, growing our economy, creating technological development of which we never dreamed, advancing science, uh, and technology, even advancing the field of aeronautics. It just impresses me what people can do. What people can do. It's a, it's a big machine, it's a nice machine, it's a fantastic engineering marvel in my opinion, the whole space shuttle. But what's the real marvel is the people behind it that make it go. Having a space shuttle enabled us to be, to be able to complete our science and do some really great things to advance the area of metallurgy. Without the space shuttle, an experiment like this one could not have been conducted. The shuttle is very important for us to learn and be able to conduct long period experiments. Out of the 50 states, 48 of them have vendors that provide parts or equipment uh, to uh, the, uh, the space uh, shuttle program. So it's uh, a vast uh, uh, cross section of America that makes the American space program what it is. Change is inevitable. As much as people don't like change, it's the only thing that's constant in our lives. And we have to change, we have to transition from shuttle uh, to a new future, which we're going to define, which can be even better. Uh, a future that allows us to explore beyond our home planet, to seek our destiny, to, to learn what we couldn't possibly learn if we were stuck in low Earth orbit. And since its return to flight, the shuttle program has been almost singularly focused on completing construction of the space station. I think back of all the challenges and all the things that had to work right 
you know, a lot of these interfaces never came together before. All the shuttle flights, the 20 plus shuttle flights that went into assembly, all the Soyuz flights, the Progress flights. To see this station come together in assembly is a true testimony to the international partnership. This is probably the most amazing research facility ever constructed in space and it's constructed internationally and it operates every day, 24 hours a day, doing world-class research internationally. And there is no more amazing facility than what we have in orbit. Through and possibly beyond 2020, the ISS will serve as the world's first full-time research laboratory in microgravity. Among zero-G experiments already conducted aboard the station, several have led to promising breakthroughs in the research and treatment of cancer. Many other on-orbit science findings have the potential to significantly improve the quality of life back on Earth. In May 2009, Atlantis and its STS-125 crew took to space not to visit the ISS, but to return to the Hubble Space Telescope for its final servicing mission. On five spacewalks, Atlantis astronauts repaired and upgraded the Hubble Telescope to significantly improve its capacity to explore the depths of the universe until at least 2014. I think of all the fingerprints that are all over this thing. It's a phenomenal piece of machinery. It's a phenomenal airplane. And it really is an engineering marvel. The uh, space shuttle will uh, go down in history as one of the great flying machines that uh, America has, has produced. The space shuttle, you know, at this time was a vehicle for bringing people together from all around the planet and having us work in harmony for the betterment of humankind. We may not have understood when we first built it what all we'd be able to accomplish with it. And after many years, we've realized just how useful it has been. It's been a learning experience on, on how to operate and live in space. What can you say about the space shuttle? It has changed everything. Well, the shuttle, from my perspective, is one of the, the great things that this nation has done. It was uh, a lot of pride. Uh, like I said, it's, it's inspiring to come to work every single day to work on this program. I'd go tomorrow if I had the opportunity. Lift off of the Challenger of Columbia. Discovery and the shuttle has been landed. For more than 30 years, the fleet and thousands of Americans dedicated to its safety and success have toiled in exhilarating triumph, heartbreaking tragedy, and most often, quiet obscurity. Their contributions have extended beyond the bounds of space. Among others, Shuttle-derived technologies have been used in developing an artificial heart and limbs, three-dimensional biotechnology, a light for treating tumors in children, and improving crime prevention and wildfire detection. From crawler driver to payload specialist, from scuba diver to pilot, from scientist to engineer, they and many like them throughout the nation share a commitment to sending humankind safely into space. That dedication, as much as any other acclaim, will be the legacy of America's space shuttle. I think we'll be remembered in thousands of years, you know, as perhaps the most incredible technological uh, feat of humans of our time. As is the order of life, an ending for the space shuttle becomes a beginning for a space-bound successor. Soon, America will again send astronauts into orbit and beyond to do what NASA does best, 